Score, the podcast. The only show taking you inside the studios of the world's most celebrated composers and musicians. From beautiful downtown Burbank, I'm your host, Kenny Holmes, alongside my co-host, Robert Kraft. Hey, Hey, Robert. Thanks, Kenny. It's great to be here, and I'm excited we finally got to this moment where our first podcast is about to kick off. Yes, and we have a huge guest right out of the gate. One of my favorite composers. Oscar-nominated, Emmy Award-winning composer John Debney. You may know him from some of your favorite John Favreau films like Elf, Iron Man 2, and Jungle Book. Also, some legendary comedies with Jim Carrey, Liar Liar, Bruce Almighty, and uh, a lot of animated films as well. He's, a, he's the chameleon of the composer world. Yeah, and he's also got a huge hit uh, this year with Greatest Showman. Yes. A, just enormous movie. And I actually had the opportunity to work with John on a number of films. We may even surprise him later in the podcast by playing some of the music that he did while we were working together. Oh. oh. Uh, also, we're going to go behind the score with director James Cameron talking about Avatar and specifically the incredible work by his partner in crime, the late James Horner. And uh, lastly, our favorite feature that we're going to do in this podcast, Name That Score. Can we do it together? Name Name That that Score. score. Yeah, we're going to have some fun. Uh, I also want to introduce our executive producer and the mastermind behind finally getting this podcast going, Matt Schrader. He's on the mic as well. Hey, guys. Hey, how's it going? We're very excited. So uh, first off, you know, you may not know who we are. We're going to be bringing you your favorite composers and and some of the legends of Hollywood. But uh, just so you are on pace with who we are, uh, first off, I want to introduce my my co-host here, Robert Kraft. He is somebody who has been on all sides of Hollywood. He's been in the trenches writing music. He's also been the head of Fox Music for nearly 20 years yeah. and uh, behind some of the biggest... Movies in Hollywood. I was lucky. So many movies. I got to work on lots of great movies and meet all these composers, many of whom we'll talk to. Kenny, it's fun to be here with you and Matt. You know, I I always think about, as far as I knew, you were both reporters, journalists, filmmakers who had this idea to make this movie score. And I we met, of course, when you came to interview me. And I thought, wait a minute. For the movie. Yeah, for the movie. And uh, I thought, are there actually other people that love film music the way that I do who had this idea, which was so obvious at the time, but no one had thought of it, which you guys did. Let's make a movie about composers and their process. Yeah, and you know, originally we sat down with Robert for his expertise, being somebody who was an executive in Hollywood, you know, behind a lot of these big films. But then we hit it off and, and, you know, if anyone knows someone in Hollywood, it's Robert Kraft. You can't go to a deli in town without getting stopped three times. <laughs> Which Boy, deli are we going to? You know, I can think of a couple after this podcast we could go to. We'll bring Debney with us. Oh, all right. Uh, so, and I uh, again, um, Matt Schrader, our executive producer, you may recognize his name as the director of Score, a film music documentary. Uh, we all worked on this project together, and it sort of inspired the podcast, which we had talked about for a long time doing while we were putting score the, the the documentary together so we're finally doing it guys and uh again our our guest today we're here in his studio john debney uh we're really excited to have him here and uh, he's gonna again play name that score with us which will be really fun and what's the the topic today john Matt? williams oh. some of the best john williams scores I've well if you them. can't name a john williams score you may not know anything about Hollywood. <laughs> a good place to Something start. Something tells me he'll know a few. And I actually know, not surprisingly, that John Debney has a great relationship and, of course, huge admiration for Maestro Williams. So it's kind of perfect to start it with Debney playing Name That Score with but John Williams. The, the music is backwards. So don't get, don't think this is going to be. You're we'll, gonna we'll, skate we'll explain right it through. a little bit later, but uh, yeah, it may be trickier than you think. Uh, we'll try not to embarrass anybody. Um, I, w- I do want to ask real quick, since uh, you know we're we're shooting the breeze here. What uh, what have you been watching lately, Robert? Do you have anything uh, musical or, or Hollywood related that you've been watching? That you I've actually been excited about the music in Stranger Things, the TV show. I thought that great um, music. 
Stein and Dixon, I believe are their names, the two guys who are in a band called Survive. They've done this thing with analog synths, this kind of incredible both throwback, but it's really contemporary. and It's like new old. It is new old. <laughs> it's everything old is new again. And they are natural film composers. I don't think they even were intending to be film composers. You know, the story is the Duffer brothers heard one of their tracks from them as a band. I think the band was called Survive and said, or put maybe a track from Survive into it. Yeah, a, I think they scored they, right, the pilot. They, they with tempt it. the pilot. And P.S., these guys are great. Really, really interesting. And I just, I love that theme song. So we might get to them. Maybe we'll get lucky and there'll be guests on Score oh, the awesome. Podcast. I would love it. Um, I, I do want to bring up something cool. Uh, you know, we just came through the Olympic season and, and figure yeah. skating. I was watching I, Tanya. And I noticed something kind Great of in, movie. in the background. Yeah, it wasn't like a, it wasn't scored as much as it was a, a soundtrack with classic songs. But I noticed when she was skating, um, and I actually went back and YouTube the real clip because I wasn't sure. There, no, there's no way. But she, when she landed her huge, famous jump that kind of, you know, set the, it, it was the legendary jump that she landed. She was actually skating to one of my favorite scores. And you wouldn't think a figure skater was skating to, Danny Elfman's Batman. Theme. I never knew that. Uh, so that was I, I. I. I rewound it a couple. I'm like, is that? Oh my god! Like this would be <laughs> a perfect example of how film music is influencing world culture, sports, dancing, ice skating. Well, and we've actually heard from the Shibatani's who won bronze in the Olympics. Um, that they they watched score and they're big fans of it. Um, and Love I, that. I brought Figure them a skaters. copy. Of, yeah, I brought them a copy of it at a, an event here in town. So um, it's exciting to hear. And they were saying how you know the music is really is what inspires them in, in doing that. So. We went off on a little tangent here about figure skating, but it was very interesting that that you know film music is an inspiration to what they're doing out there. And I just thought that was so interesting that Danny Elfman's Batman theme was a figure skating song in like the 90s. Love that. And I think it's a perfect segue to the fact that we're going to take our listeners behind the scenes and behind the screens, right? We're going to oh, show them like that. how the work is done on movies, video games, and television shows from these magnificent artists that write the music. And speaking of magnificent artists, coming up after the break, we're sitting here in his studio. We're finally going to let him in. Uh, we're joined by Oscar-nominated for Passion of the Christ and yep. Emmy Award-winning composer John Debney. I'm going to have a chance to ask John a couple key questions. How does he start a film? And also, what does he do when he looks at a film for the first time and thinks, Yikes, this is a little bit of a stinker. <laughs> and we're also going to play Name That Score again with the topic of John Williams. going to be a lot of fun. Stick around. We'll be right back. Hi, Film Score fans. Matt Schrader here from Score the Podcast. We need your support as we launch into this competitive podcast world. If you like what you're hearing, tell a friend. We're working to bring you the best guests possible from the music of the screen. Better yet, leave us a review on iTunes. Thanks for telling a friend and supporting Score. Hey, we're back with John Debney, Oscar-nominated, Emmy-winning composer, and my friend of many years. It's just a pleasure to be with you, John, and get a chance to talk to you a little bit about the, the inside baseball of scoring, if that's not a mixed metaphor. John, one of the things that always impressed me was how you could go from movie to movie and many, many different styles. I mean, I always thought you were the king of comedy. You literally took movies that we worked on together wow. that weren't funny and made them funny. That's very Some sweet of you. which shall remain unnamed. Yes. But I always wondered, is there any particular genre that made you sweat when it came up to score it? Um, Robert, first of all, it's great to be with you, my old friend. Thank you so um, much. Robert Kraft is one of my favorite guys in the world. He He was always such a great supporter of me, even... When I was a young guy and didn't know anything, really. But Robert was always there, and thank you for that, man. Um, I, got, I have to be honest with you. Everything scared the heck out of me. Um, you know, when you're starting out, you kind of go blindly. You know how that is, Robert. I mean, musicians are gloriously, uh, blissfully ignorant of of really business, usually, and kind of what we 
the whole business part of it is sort of sort of uh, strange for us. Cause, so we because we want to play, right? We want to play and write songs, and we want to just jam and be out there in the world. And as a film TV composer, it's the same same dynamic. You know, we go out, we kind of throw it out there blindly, and uh, sometimes we hit a home run, and sometimes we don't. But when I work with people like you that are so good and so kind and professional, it it makes it all okay. And you learn over the years by doing. So I think to answer your question, and I know that was a long answer, um, I think I, I have a predilection. I have a, a, a knack for writing comedic music. Um, don't know why. Maybe because my dad worked at Walt Disney Studios for 40 years, and I sort of grew up listening to Mary Poppins music and all those great yeah. scores from the day and those great songs. So I think it was sort of, that was in my, my DNA. And I think that would be perhaps why I like to do comedic writing, uh, why I enjoy it. And maybe that's why I have a, a, a knack for it. You not only have a knack for it, I think that, um, I actually think that writing comedic music is the hardest skill for a composer. I think mm. you can hit a low note on a piano and it's instantly scary yeah. and you can do some sure. kind of cool pads to add some emotion, but mm -hmm. I just always was so knocked out by your comedic writing. I think you saved a couple movies that we worked on. <laughs> Another thing that Thank I've you. always wondered about as I got the opportunity to watch you work is when you first look at a film, how do you determine, I mean, you spot the film, but filmmakers think about three acts, you know, there's going to be one, two, and three. Is it always obvious to you, oh, this is the end of the first act and I have to build something here? Do you have to watch the film four times to see the rhythm? Well, that's it? a great question. Um, it's not something that I intellectually sort of map out, as it were. It's sort of a feel thing for me now, Robert. It's like you writing those great songs, you know, that you've written over the years. It's... It's a feel thing after a while. In, in the beginning of my career, yeah, it was much more nuts and bolts, you know, and there's there are certainly different, you know, tentpole areas of a film or TV show that you have to hit and acknowledge. But um, it's feel for me. It's I'm much, you know, I jump into some of these things just kind of trying to vibe it out and play a little something on the keyboard and, and come up with an idea which leads to like writing a song it leads to the bridge it leads to the chorus and then you, nice. maybe you come up with a nice chorus and then you say well, i gotta do a better intro to that similarly um so are, for for are, me yeah. are there certain notes like in a, in a horror film you would do certain things that are kind of horror film ish but with a sure. comedy is that the same thing or is it always kind of a different like, are you experimenting all the time with comedy versus, like, horror and some of the more obvious things? Yeah, I think Robert's right. I think there are certain chord changes and progressions that, or sounds that work with horror films that kind of just put you in that place. Comedy is a little different, and I, I, can, I can agree with my friend Robert. I, it depends on what the comedy is. It depends on the actors. I'll give you an example. Jim Carrey in Liar, Liar. Jim Carrey... No one, no one had ever seen a comic like him, maybe since Jerry Lewis or one of those guys. Um, and Jim was just frenetic to the point of he was doing something every moment with his facial expressions or with it or what he was saying or his, his physical comedy. So my comedic take on Liar Liar was different than, let's say, a comedic take on you name all the other yeah. great comedians out there. It's sort of... You have to see the pace and the timbre and, and the, the frenetic quality of the performer. And to me, then that does dictate. I think with comedy writing, it's, it is timing, after all. And it is sort of, therefore, timing based on the performance. And I hope that makes sense. Well, you just actually answered the question of what makes a great composer, which is you watch the character and you listen to their Tamber. I mean, that's very subtle. You're not just scoring the scene. You're getting inside it. And it's interesting you mentioned Liar Liar because I remember reading, I can't exactly remember which actor in the film said that working on that film next to Jim Carrey, that every take was 
cut in half because the entire yeah. crew fell out yeah. because he was doing something different every take. Every take. And it was just hysterically improvisatory and nutty and they could hardly finish takes because he was it's absolutely the, peak, true. the peak of his. I think he was at the peak. Yeah. Well, you'll, that's why our director, Tom Shadiak, added the, um, the outtakes at the very oh, end. Of, yeah. I don't know if people remember. And I remember Tom saying, yeah, we're going to put a lot of the, the other versions of scenes in because it was just that. It was so hilarious. And they couldn't put everything in. How so. great. It was a big film. One other thing I wondered about, and it came from something that Gary Marshall said about how he loved to eat lunch with you. Yeah. It Thanks reminds me that the relationship between you and the director is hopefully incredibly special and kind of nonverbal mm -hmm. and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, any feeling about hmm, how you navigate when that is a little, as we all know, n you're not getting each other, but you have to keep your mm -hmm. diplomat hat on. How do you navigate? Well, that's a, that's a another terrific question um yes it's sort of the initial meeting i think even let's say if i haven't gotten a job let's say you've called me which you have many times thank you very much and you said i'd like to, you to meet this person and the director of this film usually there's a first impression i think that i'm i'm sure i give and i get back and i think i can gauge at this point in my career what that might feel like or where it might go for instance, with Gary Marshall, I met him for the first time on the set of Princess Diaries 1. And I'll never forget it. Uh, was brought into the, the, they were shooting up here and was brought into this little classroom scene. And they're sitting, you know, in the front row was this little young girl with glasses on, Anne Hathaway. And I just remember they, they said, okay, roll it. And she did a scene. And I remember they were done with the scene, and I remember thinking to myself, oh, my God, this is a major star here. Then Gary came over, and he goes, yeah, music. He goes, music. Hey, Gary Marshall. I go, hi, Gary. I'm such a big fan, blah, 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 blah. And he goes, yeah, I like this uh, the thing. I heard something you did. You want to do this show? And it was sort of like <laughs> that. And it was an immediate love, immediate connection, immediate, you know, there were no walls, and we did that, and I'm thankful to say I did, I think, seven or eight movies with him. God oh. bless him. And everyone was a joy and a treasure. Uh, he never, he never, even if he didn't like a piece of music, you know, he'd, he'd say, I, did, I don't know if I like the flutes. You know, flutes, they get in the way. Speaking of timbre, you know, the ladies are talking. I don't know if the flutes work. So that was his, what you're suggesting. You get to know both the uh, verbal cues from a director and the nonverbal cues from a director. On the other side of the spectrum, a man I greatly admire and I've, I've had a great time working with is Mel Gibson. And Mel is such a great actor, such a great director, that he's nonverbal. So if he doesn't like something, he'll sort of, you know, hem and haw, and he'll look around, and he'll walk around, and he'd be, it's very difficult for him to verbalize why he doesn't like something. But I, I got to know him well enough that I know oh, he doesn't like it, you know. I love that. I love hearing that. I've actually been in situations where the composer has been on the stand, yeah. conducted a cue, come back in and said to the director in the room where I thought, that sounded good. Yeah. I know what's wrong. I'll fix it. And I thought, wait a minute. Oh. I thought it sounded good. Yeah. I, nobody said anything. And the director would nod his head and say, thanks. And I thought, these guys wow. are on some... Yeah astral plane great level yeah much more to come with john debney we're going to run through a couple clips from his more recent work and then i think robert has a special surprise clip for him that he wants to play Ooh. but first behind the score behind the score the inside stories from hollywood's greatest filmmakers and composers Though not a composer, director James Cameron has earned quite a reputation for himself as a musical storyteller. His longtime collaborator was none other than James Horner, a legendary composer in his own right. The two worked together on a number of films, including Titanic, which became the top movie soundtrack of all time. Their last collaboration before Horner passed away was another milestone, the biggest box office hit of all time, Avatar. Here is Oscar-winning director James Cameron. Avatar is a completely different problem. 
because it took place on another planet, different culture. We spent a lot of time creating the language for the Navi to always remind you that they were not us. That this was not some kind of cheesy science fiction film that just sort of glosses over the surface of cultural differences. We were drilling deep. So I asked James, so what can we come up with that we can incorporate into the score that sounds alien and sounds indigenous at the same time? He went out and did, geez, I don't know, it was months. He worked with an ethnomusicologist, and the first thing he did was just compile a whole bunch of different sounds. There were Bulgarian throat singers and, uh, and uh, you know, different uh, vocal styles from, from all over the world and, and different kind of bizarre indigenous instruments, woodwinds and stringed instruments, stuff you'd never heard before. We put it all together and then we sat and listened to it all and we agreed that some sounds were really unique and strange. From that exercise, he went out to figure out ways to, to create a unique sound that felt of another world, but at the same time hold on to those ways that music predictably for a large number of people makes them have an emotional or encourages them to have an emotional reaction. And I think, you know, the result was an amazing score, uh, one of his best scores, and because it has the best of his big kind of orchestral energy and power uh, with these really strange vocal overlays and, and pa some passages that are completely carried by vocals. Horner passed away in 2015, but Cameron says his musical legacy will continue to live on in his films, including Avatar 2, scheduled for release in 2020. For more stories behind the score, read Score, the interviews, based on the international hit film Score, a film music documentary featuring raw insight from Hans Zimmer, James Cameron, Quincy Jones, Randy Newman, Trent Reznor, and many more. Score, the interviews, available now at score-movie.com. John Debney, the maestro of maestros, a great composer who's spending some time with us today, telling us about what it's like to score a film. I'm gonna play a cue that John wrote from a film that he and I worked on together. I thought I'd surprise him and play something and ask him a question about an experience that we shared because he may <laughs> be able to pro provide some insight into this movie years later. You can't see, but John is wiping a tear away as we listen to this I, I'm cue. curious if he knows what it is. John, we worked on Welcome to Mooseport yep. in 19, I think, 04. Yeah. And, Gosh. Um, we were both 30. Yeah, oh, thank like you so that. much. I think and so. uh, this was one of the examples I always felt of you taking a movie that with all due respect to Donald Petrie and Ray Romano and all the great talents, Gene Hackman, you elevated the movie. Thank you. And I always wondered, and I'm going to say this delicately, when you inherit a movie that you know needs a substantial amount of support, mm -hmm. do you pace endlessly? Do you roll up your sleeves and say, I know what to do? Do you agonize over the fact that this is your gig? How do you respond when the movie isn't flowing? Let's put it that oh, way. Oh, man, that's a, that's a good one. Um, yeah, I should be very a little diplomatic with this answer. No, I honestly, in all due candor, most movies, most movies aren't great. Um, many, many movies are very good or crowd pleasers for whatever reason. But I always try to find, I have to, it's, it's a great question. I have to almost psych myself out and try to latch on to a character or two that I feel something for. And if there's a love, if there's a love story part of it, I try to make that really a beautiful, and that's what that little piece of music was. I try to make it, give it more than really maybe is on the screen. Now, that could be good or bad, 
But that's just where I go. I go into the mode of what can I do to make this as good as it can be. And, you know, and that's sort of my credo. I, I don't overthink it more than that, but you're right. There are moments where it could be funnier. It could be sadder. Um, it could be more uplifting. It could be more joyful. And that is, that's the gig, isn't it? And it's cool that you, in your position, uh, in, when we were working together on that movie, that you kind of knew that and gleaned that. Um, that's a wonderful thing because sometimes maybe it might be too much. And I then would trust the director or the head of music or someone on the on the show to say, you know... We're pushing it a little bit too much. But if you're lucky, um, and there are a number of films that I've done like that, where it starts out being a pretty darn good film, but my goal is always to make it as good as it can be, or better. And that's that's a case in point. Yeah, I think it's nice you to say it starts out being a pretty darn good film because there are certain movies that you and I have both seen where it's a little bit head in hands, like where do we go from here? But I think the... The great uh, response that we're all supposed to have is love our children equally. Yes. And each one, we think yes. there's a great effort behind this, and somebody's taken eight years to get it to the screen, and yeah. God bless them. And I think it's one of the things I always admired most when you approached one of those movies was you were always upbeat, and it was going to be great, and here we go. And I'd think, God, how does he do that? It's so great. That's I, very nice of you to say I, that, I wanted to. It's hard sometimes. Yeah, oh. But, yeah, it's like, you know, any job. Well, that's that's what you were hired to do mm -hmm. is knock it out. And um, I Just before we move on, you currently have a huge hit movie in the marketplace with Greatest Showman. and um, Just saw it. I finally got around cool. to seeing it. I wanted to make sure to, to see it. And, oh, uh, awesome. We loved it. Uh, oh, my girlfriend great. and I saw it and thought it was, you know, the – the the story came together and the and the music and the songs and I'm not much of a musical guy personally um, but I, I I really enjoyed it I thought it was great thank you we we listened to I mean there's a great cue where you actually take the themes written by someone else mm -hmm. Pasek and Paul yep. um, and I wondered in scoring a musical were there opportunities for you to write any original cues mm -hmm. or was all of it derived because I heard what sounded like some original cues in between but a lot of it also was extensions of their melodies Correct. it's a funny gig to score a musical it, it's a it can be challenging and I'm so thank you for those kind words our hope was um, that it would touch a chord in everyone's hearts because the movie is about acceptance and it's about inclusion and it's about love and it's about be who you are and that's all you can do, and that's that's okay because that's a great thing to be who you are. So our hope was it would catch fire, and it has. And the coolest thing for me has been going, there, there are sing-alongs now. I don't know if you've been to these, Robert. I invite all of you that are listening, go see The Greatest Showman in a sing-along because it is a the biggest party on the planet. And everybody now, most of people that go to these have seen the movie three and four or five times. So they know every song, and the studio, Fox, great great studio, has printed the lyrics out. So it's a, a true sing-along. So, I had no idea. Yeah. It's become kind of a thing, which is cool. So to answer your question, that was a very challenging movie in that originally there were more areas for original um, melodies. And mm -hmm. that was the intention from the director at the very beginning was, John, I want you to, in these areas where we were not dealing with songs, you know, write, write themes for the different characters. Yep. What happened on that movie is that movie changed greatly after the first preview. Then they decided to do reshoots and restructuring so that some of those score moments ended up going away. Mm -hmm. And so really, in the main, you ended up with these glorious Pasek and Paul songs, and I was given the task of arranging them. And the one thing that I felt strongly about, uh, interesting sort of challenge on that movie was that the songs are very contemporary and very melodic and contemporary. And one of the discussions early on with the director uh, and I, one of the discussions we had was, you know, if the score then becomes too song-like, 
it'll become a music video very quickly. Hmm. So I kind of really, you know, dug in a little bit and said, you know, I think let me kind of do this a little more traditional way with those song trappings on top. And that's a, that I think you up nailed kind it. of separating from the song. Yeah, and that's what we ended up doing. In... I, I think you actually made it sound classic. Thank you. That and, was the intention. And it's it's almost surprising to me, and it shouldn't be, that the songs are a true bridge between musical theater mm-hmm. and pop. Yeah. And look, it's a number one soundtrack, it's I think, for three weeks in a row. Awesome. So yeah. they've really... We're grateful. And those really guys are it. so talented, those boys. I, we all call them the boys. They're like, I don't know, 28 or something. Yeah, it's scary. Yeah. It's scary. Much yeah. more with John Debney coming up. And we're also going to play Name That Score. Oh. Uh, so I hope you're ready, John. We didn't give you anything to study off of. <laughs> but uh, yeah, much more coming up with John Debney, and we're going to play Name That Score right after this. Hey, Matt Schrader here, director of Score, a film music documentary. For the latest news from the film music world, follow us on Facebook. Just search Score, a film music documentary. Or let us know who you want to hear next on the show on Twitter, at Score the Podcast. We're back here in Burbank at the Debney Studios with our guest, award-winning composer John Debney. And uh, we're excited to play a new game. Uh, This is the first run at this game, and it's called Name That Score. Let's do it. Get ready to play Name That Score! The film music game where a perfect score means you, yes you, could be a winner. Now let's play Name That Score. Here's how the game works. We will play clips of five famous film scores, uh, but in reverse, Robert, Kenny, and our guest John Debney will all choose from three multiple choice answers. The last question that we do, number five, is worth double for a maximum of six points. Our audience can also win, so if anyone runs the table, gets all the questions right, uh, we do a giveaway. Some lucky member of our social media audience will win a fabulous prize, like a copy of uh, Lord of the Rings autographed by composer Howard Shore. Um, hey. All you have to do is mention at score the podcast on Twitter uh, to enter to win that prize. Uh, and because the best scores have a theme, so does this game. Today's theme is John Williams. I've heard of him. He's so, doing all right. Yeah, new guy. <laughs> Kid's got talent. <laughs> and John, I know you. You've been a long, uh, long time John Williams fan. So I, uh, yeah. I expect some of these oh. will probably sound familiar. Uh, In reverse, though, right? In reverse, in reverse. All right, here we go. Uh, Here's your first clip. Uh, I'll give you the three options first. Is this uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, the NBC News theme, or Superman? Oh, man. NBC News theme, Superman, or Raiders of the Lost Ark? (laughs) It's just freaky. That, that is so freaky. It sounded like Star Wars. It did. It did sound like <laughs> reversed. It sounded like Star Wars. Like Paul is dead. Though. Yeah, I think that's it. <laughs> um, I'm yeah. gonna go NBC News. I don't know why. Uh, Kenny. Uh, I'm gonna go Raiders. And I'm gonna go Superman. All <laughs> How right. About that we have all three. Here's your answer. Ah, there you go. Oh, no fair. So is that there you that's go. that's the trick then? Just, all right. Point Indiana for Jones wow. backwards is super Star Wars forward. Okay. I think so. <laughs> you should try that, John. <laughs> Second Do question. your next score backwards and see how it comes out. Yeah, good. Is this one Close Encounters, Star Wars, or The Patriot? Oh, that's easy. Star Wars, baby. Yeah, that feels Star Wars-y. <laughs> that's, that's a, a Star that's Wars. A Star Wars. <laughs> All right. Points ah. for everybody. All right, uh, your third clip. Uh, your three options here: E.T., War Horse, or the Olympic Fanfare. Mm. Oh man, I'm not really familiar with War Horse off the top of my head, so that kind of sounds horse racy a little bit too. It sounds extremely Olympic to me. <laughs> it sounds Olympic to me, and and I orchestra. I had the great joy to orchestrate. One of the Olympics for John. Oh, this is an inside job. Um, it, I'm going to guess Olympics, but Warhorse had those kind of 
feelings in there. Uh, I'm, Robert, what do you got? A limp. A limp. Well, I'm, God, now a limp. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go Olympics. All right. There you go. I mean, well, John gave it away because he worked on it. So. But you know what? <laughs> wait, 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 wait. <laughs> no fair. We need another one. I, John didn't write that. That's the original Olympic fanfare. Oh, uh, I think we are getting. We're going to have to disqualify this one. We're getting schooled <laughs> by one of the. This is like the guy at Jeopardy, you know, telling Alex Trebek. Not correct. All right, that was a trick question. Everybody, <laughs> everybody got it wrong. Thank everybody you. Okay, there you go. All right, um, our fourth clip here is uh, is this uh, memoirs of a geisha, Schindler's List, or Saving Private Ryan. Mm-hmm. It's not saving Ryan's privates. That I'm certain <laughs> oh of. God. It is Schindler. I agree. I think it's Sh- Schindler's List with that beautiful, amazing Itzhak Perlman. Did he I do I think that? so. Yeah. Everybody? Kenny? Yeah, I'll just Schindler's. go with it then. Yeah. Yep. Yep. All right. Everybody Ooh. wins that one. And uh, our last clip that is worth double. Mm-mm. Uh, is this Home Alone, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, hmm. or Hook? Man, that almost if if I if that's what I think it is, it almost sounded the same backwards. The, some of the melody there. Everybody, after need to hear it again. Yeah. Could you- Home Alone, Harry Potter, or Hook? Wow. I'm just gonna. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say th- whatever John says. <laughs> no, I'm gonna say I'm gonna say Hook. Home Alone is one of my favorite John Williams scores, but I think it's more hooky. Yeah. Uh, it sounds it sounds like Hook backwards. It sounds like Hook. You know what? I'm feeling really strongly that it's Hook because <laughs> these two guys both feel Hook. So everybody's going with Hook. We're hooking. Yeah. All right, let's keep in mind. Okay. Kenny has a perfect score so far, Ooh. so if he wins, then uh, we I credit, do a giveaway. Wow. <laughs> I credit these guys for, I, <laughs> I just piggybacked on most of their answers. Here's your answer. It does sound yeah. very similar. It's it this, is Hook. It's, it's the it's same hook. backwards. Yeah. It's hook. It, 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 that's what was so tricky, because Home Alone, da, da, dee, da, da, da. Yeah. And this one's, dee, da, 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 da. It's something. If it worked. It could have gone either way. If it ain't broke. <laughs> so our uh, our final score Ken, here. Kenny. We have uh, in second place, Robert and John, and uh, our first place winner of our inaugural edition of the game is Kenny Holmes. John, I, I'm sorry, man. Next time. Well, the real winner is the social media audience. The real winners are social media Because someone's going to win a soundtrack That's now. That's so cool. So, all right. Well, John, we want to thank you for joining us and having us here at your beautiful studio here in Burbank. Uh, my pleasure. Love having you guys. In fact, you're not staying or... We were thinking of moving in, actually. Okay. Just, just to hang. Watch, <laughs> I have watch you work today. You can't see this, but there are comfy chairs all over the place and it's a big beautiful. screen. We could... Yeah. Yeah. We can just out. watch you work on something. Yes. We do want to take a quick second to mention to our, our listeners that this is a brand new podcast and it goes nowhere without people listening. So please tell a friend and make sure to go subscribe on iTunes and leave a review. And uh, be sure to follow us at Score the Podcast on Twitter. I want to give a special thank you to our guest, John Debney. It's just been great to talk to you today, John. My pleasure. For Kenny Holmes. Matt Schrader, I'm Robert Kraft. We'll see you next time.